Hey, Jared Valley Church, Pastor John here, and we are kicking off week three in our Kingdom Citizenship uh, module. Uh, this week we are looking at the kingdoms of the earth, and the kingdoms of the earth are just all the various governments that have existed in our world. A simple definition of government is the system by which a nation, state, or community is governed. And so governments have existed in various forms throughout history. There have been complex governments, there have been very simple governments, there have been tribal governments, there have been monarchies, there have been oligarchies, and there have been democracies. Government can take all kinds of shapes and sizes, but its fundamental idea is how does it uh, order and, and direct a group of people? And one of the questions is, uh, is government just something that humans have created on their own, kind of out of necessity? Uh, is government a necessary evil that we just kind of have to put up with? Uh, or is government something that has actually been instituted and created by God for our good? Where does a government get its authority to do things like say, this is wrong, and to punish people for breaking those rules? Where does it get its authority? It, where does it get its authority to go to war against another state or to impose taxes on its people? These are some of the questions that we will be looking at this week. And so we have three videos for you. Uh, the first one, which is this one, is looking at where our United States government sees its authority coming from. Our second video is looking at where does the Bible say the authority of government comes from and what are the limits of that authority. And then our third video is looking at the three purposes of government that we see in Scripture. So. A lot of this uh, uh, material that we're looking at in this week comes from a book by Jonathan Lehman uh, called How the Nations Rage. You can buy it on Amazon. If you read it, you'll recognize a lot of similar material, uh, but it goes into more depth in some of these things. So I would recommend you grab that if you do want to dive deeper. Also, I want to just note that I am not an expert in a lot of what we're talking about here, particularly when we look at some of the historical and, and philosophical background to how the United States government got formed. And so a lot of my research has come from reading a big stack of books uh, from people that I trust, but I also pulled books from people uh, that represent different views uh, from my own to try to do a, a good job of, of giving various perspectives and most of all, giving something that is faithful to Scripture. But I'm sure uh, there are people who have different views on some of this, and I'm sure I'm missing some things that maybe you think are important. Uh, that's where we're collecting feedback, and so if there is something like that, make sure you uh, let us know in that feedback form on the webpage for this. Well, let's jump in uh, for our section today. Where does the authority of government come from? To answer this question, for how many people think about it, let me just come up with a scenario. Imagine that we were flying across the Pacific Ocean, and suddenly our plane crashes and it lands on an uninhabited island somewhere in the South Pacific. Now, it's chaos, but fortunately there's a nurse and a doctor who quickly jump up and start helping the wounded. And then we learn that evening that one of the uh, passengers on the plane was a world-renowned spear fisherman. And so he's going out and spearing fish, and we're cooking them on a fire so that we can eat. But as we go on and, and gather food, we discover that there are wild boars on the island, and they like to come and pillage all of our food at night. And so we set up a watch schedule. But before long, there's some drama. So let's say Kimo, our spear fisherman, thinks, well, I should get twice the amount of fish because I'm catching him. I mean, shouldn't I get something more? And then others, though, are saying, but we're not getting enough to eat. And so they start fighting. There are a few people who don't want to get up in the middle of the night for the watch uh, when they're scheduled, and so they just sleep through it. And the wild boars come and ravage the food, and, and people are like, well, shouldn't they be held responsible for not holding up their end of the bargain? And then to add to some of the drama, uh, people start getting feelings for each other. It's kind of like lost meets survivor. And so let's say one of the people on this island is a guy named Hugo. And Hugo is great at climbing up the coconut trees, and he loves to grab coconuts, and he started really liking this girl named Claire. And so Hugo, every morning, gives Claire a fresh coconut. He opens it up and sticks a straw in it. And you might ask, where does he get the straw from? Well, as we know, plastic straws never disintegrate, which is bad for the environment, but great for these groups of survivors, because there are plastic straws all over the beach. And so Kimo, or sorry, Hugo uh, loves to give Claire the fresh coconut with a clean straw in it, and uh, he does it every day. But then some people get upset because, well, we want coconuts too. But Hugo says, well, I'm not going to climb a coconut tree for you. I like Claire. I'm only going to do it for her. And so tensions are running high. 
And everyone finally comes together on the beach and they need to work through all of this drama and come up with a system if they want to survive. And they go through all their arguments, they debate back and forth, a few coconuts get thrown, and they come up with a set of rules that everyone can agree on. So they don't get too specific, they allow people certain freedoms, but they also seem to manage the necessities for if they want to make it uh, by living on this island together. And then they also outline a set of consequences for if people people don't abide by these rules they've all agreed on. And what you see is this group of islanders has just set up what we would call a government. And what gives this government its authority? Well, it is all of these uh, stranded people on this island coming together and consenting to agree to these rules and this constitution, we could say, that they have come up with. We, the people, agree that these are good rules. They govern the areas of life that we need to work on in order to survive. And so the authority for their government doesn't come from some higher standard or moral authority, ultimate moral authority, but it is what this group of people have come together and agreed is good. Now, this is a common way that people think about government, and it is sometimes called the social contract. There is a contract between the people that then form a government to rule over them, and they all agree to follow the rules of that government. They willingly put themselves under its authority. Now, with this understanding of a social contract, listen to the first words of our Constitution. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. So, who gives authority to the United States government to rule? It says there in the text, we the people. It is this idea of a social contract that lies behind the United States Constitution. The authority of our Constitution comes from we the people. And this is important. Now, in the Declaration of Independence, you're familiar with that, and you know that there's some vague language in there referring to a deity. Uh, it uses language like nature's God, or the Creator, or the Almighty. But when it comes to actually drafting the Constitution, that language falls out, and the authority and basis for our government is not rooted in God, or a Creator, or some deity, but in we, the people. People are the ultimate authority. And all future laws are going to be interpreted off of this constitution and how the people vote. They are the highest standard of the land. And if they want to change something, well, the majority of the people are able to do that. In fact, in 1864, the NRA, not the NRA that you're thinking of, but the National Reform Association, which was made up of mostly Presbyterians, sought to combat the secular drift they saw in America. Now, bear in mind, this is 1864. And they argued that the Constitution is a secular covenant because it doesn't acknowledge the authority of Jesus Christ. And they thought this is crucial for the government, but ultimately their efforts failed to make a change to the Constitution. Well, why was our Constitution set up this way? And it is helpful to understand some of the historical and philosophical background that our country was founded out of. We don't have time to cover it all here, but a great book that I found to be helpful is called The Contested Public Square by Greg Forster. And he traces the development of Christian thought on politics and government power from the early church up into the 20th century. Now, some of the worst violence in Europe occurred in the uh, decades and couple centuries after the Reformation, where Martin Luther and others broke away from the Catholic Church and started various Protestant churches. And as European nations swung back and forth, Catholic to Protestant, Catholic to Protestant, depending on who the monarch was at that point, uh, there was all kinds of violence that followed it as the people that you know were no longer in power, and, and if the 
Protestants were in power, well, the Catholics were often kicked out, and, and sometimes uh, the Protestants would go and ransack the, Protest the Catholic churches and destroy all of their relics. And then when the pendulum swung the other way, the Catholics would imprison and, and uh, martyr uh, many Protestants as heretics. And over the next two centuries, this violence would escalate to full-scale civil wars as well as international wars. Now, why was there so much violence uh, it, it, happening as there was this kind of fight between the Catholics and Protestants? Well, one of the reasons was their understanding of what we call natural law. Natural law is this idea that there is an eternal moral law that is knowable by all human beings by reason and conscience. So it is independent from re your religious beliefs. We as humans know, have an innate sense of what is right and what is wrong. Now, natural law is also affected by sin. So it's marred, but it is still there. So a good example today is people know that it is wrong to kill. You don't see people advocating for just, you know, blind killings of others. We get upset about that. And yet, many people are okay with abortion, which is killing other human beings. And yet, because of this sense of natural law has been marred by sin, we are inconsistent in how we apply and see what is good and what is right. And so it was believed in the time prior to the Reformation that a shared community religion was necessary to maintain and preserve natural law so that a society doesn't slip away from kind of everyone agreeing to what is generally moral and right. And religion had a way of preserving that. And so therefore heresy and other religious offenses weren't just seen as sins, but actually dangerous to society because they could undermine the very foundation on which the society was set apart or set upon. And so you see, that is why there was so much violence during the Reformation, because th these Protestants and Catholics were fighting for what they believed truth was. Now, in 1665, England sent a uh, diplomatic mission to the city of Cleves, which was in northwest Germany. And due to a number of factors, Cleves was a city in political limbo. So much of England was swinging back and forth between Catholic and Protestant, but uh, depending on, on what religion the, the monarch was. Uh, but Cleves, for a number of reasons, uh, was kind of outside of that. They were in this state of limbo. They didn't have a ruler and a clear religion of that city. And so, because of that, you started to see various Catholic and Protestant churches popping up and people could pick which one they wanted to go to. And to the surprise of these delegates from England, the place hadn't descended into anarchy, which is what they would have expected to have happen if there wasn't a state religion. And one of the delegates, by the name of John Locke, so now we're sounding a whole lot more like Lost, <laughs> wrote, I cannot observe any quarrels or animosities amongst them on the account of religion. And he was absolutely shocked by this. And this had a big impact on John Locke. He was a young teacher of moral philosophy at Oxford, and he became very influential for developing the idea of religious toleration, and many of our founding fathers seized upon some of his ideas. He believed religious toleration was important and fundamental to civil order and the way that you could prevent the violence that had wrecked Europe since the Reformation. And Locke argued from Scripture that God did not intend for the civil government to enforce matters of faith. And Locke also argued that a person becomes a member of the government when he, quote, authorizes the society to make laws for him as the public good of the society shall require. Locke is developing what we now call this idea of a social contract. It is the people that have the right to form their own government. He's saying that the government exists by the consent of the members of the community. 
Quote, where any number of men have so consented to make one community or government, they are thereby presently incorporated and make one body politic, wherein the majority hath the right to act and conclude the rest. So, let's bring these strands that we've looked uh, at so far to, uh, together to see what our United States Constitution uh, was developed out of. And so if, if we think of kind of three streams that are coming together, there's the stream of religious toleration. Then we have this stream that we've looked at of uh, the social contract, people are the authority for the government. Okay, and then the next stream that we've briefly looked at is this idea of natural rights or natural law. And, and these three streams come together in the US Constitution. How so? Well, it's this idea that we don't want the bloodbath of Europe, so let's have religious toleration. We believe that the, the authority from people to be governed comes from their consent to be governed. They set up the government. And then also that people have endowed in them certain natural rights or a natural law that has been given to them and uh, people know that it is inherent in them. So these three things come together to what forms the United States government. And it has worked incredibly well and been successful in many ways, but there's one fatal flaw with this system. What happens when, because of religious toleration, and remember that the religious toleration with the John Locke and the founders was really focused on the fight between Catholics and Protestants. That was their idea of religious toleration. Right? And even though we're different and we number the Ten Commandments differently, uh, we still believe there are Ten Commandments and they say the same thing. But what happens when a society, because of religious toleration, gets to a point where it cannot then agree on what natural law is? They can't agree on what is right or moral or necessary for happiness. And remember, one of the ideas behind natural law or rights was that a shared religion is necessary to keep those shared values intact in a society so that the majority of the people would agree on this is what is right, this is what is moral. You see, what has happened here is you've removed the foundation for what preserves natural law in a society, and that is its shared religion. And while it doesn't, well, actually, and one other thing, and because then the authority for the government comes from the people, if a majority of the people then have a change in views of what is right and good, what is moral, that can lead to further problems. And it doesn't seem like John Locke or our founding fathers spent a lot of time thinking about this particular scenario. But there was one person who did see it as troubling. And this was Alexis de Tocqueville. Uh, he was the French diplomat who wrote that big book, Democracy in America. Uh, I tried reading it once and only made it a little bit uh, into it. But in 1835, he published this book. And in it, he worried that, and, and this is Greg Forrester's take on it, that the leveling spirit of democracy might already be on the way to producing an egalitarian tyranny in which anyone who disagreed with the majority opinion was viewed as a public enemy. It was democracy in America that popularized the phrase, the tyranny of the majority. And de Tocqueville's point is that when people hold the ultimate authority in a government, Morality then becomes what seems best to the greatest number of people. And there can then become a tyranny of the majority. And I think this is the fundamental struggle that our nation is wrestling through right now. 
because we don't have any place in the way that our government was set up for that preserving effect of the natural law. And for all of the good that our founding fathers did, they produced a great nation, one that I am proud to be part of. I, I love our country. And yet, on one hand, it seems they may have set up a system that at one day was bound to fail. They inherited an understanding of rights and morality and equality from the Christian faith, but then in our Constitution severed it from that foundation. Or as Jonathan Lehman put it, they took the flowers even if they cut them from the roots.